Hello everybody, in this video I'm going to introduce the APCSP create task. Alright, let's get going. So AP Computer Science Principles, like every other AP course, has an AP exam. The exam has two parts. The first part is 70 multiple choice questions in 120 minutes. This is a standard kind of thing that you do in every other AP test. The second part though is the create task, and this is something that you do before the AP exam date in May. It's a portfolio assignment, so you're going to submit it to the AP digital portfolio, again, before the AP exam date in May. If you've taken other AP classes, you're probably not used to seeing this, but AP Art does the same thing, where you submit your art to a portfolio site, and then it gets graded there. Now let's look at what you actually have to do for the create task. The create task is done in class or at home, not in an exam room. How much time do you get? Well, you get 12 hours in class, and if you need more time, you're also allowed to work on it at home if you need that time. You're going to need to make three things, a code, a video, and some answers to some questions. Your AP grade depends almost entirely on how well you answer those questions and not how cool or how good your code is. So that's so lopsided and weird for most kids. I'm going to say that one more time. Your AP score will depend on how you answer those questions. So to make an analogy, the questions that you answer are like a house and your code is like the foundation of the house. If the foundation is good enough, then all anybody ever cares about is the house. It's only when the code is lacking something, well then now your code matters. So what does the code need? Well, the first thing it needs is an input. So this is something like typing the keyboard, moving or clicking your mouse, a microphone, data stream like Twitter, or also input from a file. So if you're working in Python, for example, you might have a line of code like this, where input is the command that you're using to get input from the user by asking a question and saving it to a variable. And that input comes via keyboard. If you're working with Scratch, you can use the ask command, which does the same thing. Or you can have events that are looking for when you press a key or maybe when you click the mouse or something like that. Next thing you'll need is an output. And this output needs to depend on what you input. So for example, maybe depending on what you type to the keyboard, it'll print different things to screen. Depending on what keys you press or how you move your mouse, it'll move your video game character differently. Or depending on what it read from file, it'll output different things to a file. All right. The next thing your code needs is it needs to have a list. And that list needs to be better than if you didn't have a list. And you're going to have to write about why it's better. And you're going to have to write about what your code would look like without that list. So if that's confusing, here are some examples to help make it clear. So here's a program you've already written, the prizes program. On the left is the program with lists. On the right is the program without lists. The main difference between the two codes is highlighted in red. And you can see right now, the one on the left is shorter and more readable. In the future, if I were to add more prizes, the program on the right would have to add LF, 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 LF with all the prizes, which is a much harder code to maintain. So in the case of the prizes program, which you've already done, whenever I'm able to say what item I want by a number, I'm going to have a win by using a list. This is a very similar example that you've already done when you did the Hogwarts lab, picking a random item from a list. The differences are highlighted in red. Once again, you see that right now we have a shorter code, which is more readable. And in the future, if I add more prizes or houses that I need to pick from in a code with no list, I would have to add elf, 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 elf. And so you can see that the code with lists is an easier code to maintain. Here's a third example, looping inside a function where the number of items is unknown. So this is code you've done before, biggest pumpkins. The one on the left is how it looks with the list. The one on the right is how it looks without a list for four items that I'm checking. They are almost completely different. The code with a list has shorter lines and it's a lot less error prone. So it's easy to screw up this or this or this when I'm doing without lists. And really the big thing is the code without lists only works for a fixed and unchanging number of items, in this case four. And if you're looking at the future, if I were to add more items I wanted to compare, I would have to rewrite this code on the right with more elifs and change each if line to add more Boolean expressions. And that's a real pain. So in the case where I don't know exactly how many items I need to loop over, Iteration is a win for lists. Last example I'm going to show is if you use a list method. Remember, a list method is some powers you gain when you're using a list that you don't have if you're just a regular string, an integer, or something like that. So here's an example where I'm using the append list method. In this code, we're looping over a list and keeping the words that start with SM. So the code differences are highlighted in red. And right away, you can see that the list code is shorter and therefore more readable. The other thing you can see is that the no list code has undefined variables sitting around doing nothing, which is not a good thing. 
And in the future, if I want to have more than four items, well, I can't do it with just individual variables. I'd have to add more variables. And so what that does is gives me undefined variables or else I risk not having enough variables. And that's bad. So list is going to allow me to use append, which is a win for problems that are dynamic or changing. So in summary, I'd say do one of these in your code. Pick an item from a list by number. Pick a random item from a list. Loop over your list when you don't know how many items there are. Or use a list method like append. I'll say it again. It's super important. Pick an item from a list by number. Pick a random item from the list. Loop over that list when you don't know how many items are there. Or use a list method like append. One more possibility is to use a dictionary. If you know what a dictionary is, I assume you're advanced enough to figure this out. But dictionaries are allowed. The last major thing that your code needs is a function. But that's not enough. The function has to have a parameter. It needs to have sequencing, which just means multiple lines. It needs to have selection, which is an if, elif, else. There are other things that could qualify depending on the language you are using. And it needs to have iteration, which is basically a loop. And there are multiple options here, again, depending on what language you are using. The last thing your function needs to do is to take different paths through that function, depending on what the values of your parameters are. And that can be a little bit confusing, so I'm going to go over it right now. Here is example one. It's the maximum function that we showed before. The first line shows the function, which scores the point for having a function, method, or procedure. The parameter is right here. Sequencing happens because there's multiple lines. The selection happens right here. It's the if. Any sort of if or elif gives selection. The iteration is here. Any sort of for or while is iteration. Different paths, that's the hardest part. I'm going to go over that right now. OK, so if I call this function with this list right here, the numbers will equal to this list right here, 9991532. And as I start, biggest will equal to 999. And if that's true, the code that's going to run is the code in red. The if statement which check to see if number is bigger than the biggest, will never be true. So that next line is never run. And so again, the code that is run is the code that I've outlined in red. If I call this function a different way with a different argument, so my argument now is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Numbers is now equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. At some point, numbers greater than biggest will be true, and it will run biggest equals number. So the code that's run is the code that's highlighted in blue. And this highlight is different from the previous highlight. So because of that, my function takes different paths depending on the value of the parameter. Here is another example. I've got an algorithm that gives the rating for a movie. So here's the function. Here's the parameter. Actually, there are two this time. Sequencing exists because there are multiple lines. There's selection because there's an if and an else. There's iteration because there's a for. Now let's see about this different paths thing. So my second argument here is going to be true. That means is Sam is going to be true. The parameter is Sam is going to be true, which means the code that runs is highlighted here in red. If I change my call so that my second argument is false, then is Sam will be false. And then it will run the code that's highlighted in blue. So there it takes different paths depending on my parameter value. So to summarize this whole thing, you need a function or parameter or method. That function has to have a parameter, so some sort of input into it. Sequencing, so more than one line. Selection, an if, elif, else, something like that. Iteration, which is just a loop, which can show up in different forms in different languages. And the trickiest of all, it's got to take different paths depending on the value of that parameter when you call it. All right, so as I'm writing this code, there are some rules on who can help you do it. So who can't help you is the teacher. There is no help from the teacher whatsoever, at least when it comes to writing your code or answering the questions. So if you have a question about how do I make a PDF, or what are the rules of what I'm supposed to do? The teacher can help you there, but if you can't figure out why your code doesn't work, the teacher can't help. So pretty much the only people allowed to help you are current CSP students, current students taking AP CSP. And everything else is cheating. So that means former AP CSP students, AP CSA students, former or present or any other student, really. Tutors, aunts, uncles, grandmas, grandpas, whatever, neighbors, teachers in other classes, TAs, and definitely ChatGPT is cheating. Students are even allowed to submit the same code, but the video must be made independently, so you can't work together on the video. And questions, you can't work together on the questions either. All right, so the very last thing I want to talk about is the program. And what should I write? Students ask this all the time. And my main suggestion is this. Make a simple program first. Think about the requirements. Make sure you fulfill the requirements. And then once you fulfill the requirements, then make it more complicated after that. I see it a lot. Students run out of time. 
because they're trying to do something that's too ambitious. So don't run out of time. Do something simple, fulfill the requirements, and then make a cool it later. My second suggestion is no straight up games. So this is an excerpt from a chat group. It basically suggests it's hard to score one of those points. There's six points. It's hard to score one of them if you make a game. Here's another thing from the AP board. This is a video that they made where they look down on entertainment as a purpose for a program. So don't take any chances with your grader. Don't take a chance that your grader hates games. Just make a program that's not a game. Finally, if you really, really want to make a game, there are ways to make it acceptable, I think, and turn it into edutainment. So for instance, bad might be straight up Wordle, but good might be Wordle where the words that are in Wordle are used to review for biology vocab before a test. So if you're going to make a game, my suggestion is to make it an educational game. Again, not a straight up game, an educational game. And that's pretty much it. Go code. All right, so that's pretty much it. Hope that was useful to you. And if it was, please give this video a like and subscribe to my channel. I'll see you next time.